Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's session, New Mexico's Death Map, Uranium and Nuclear Energy in the U.S. My name is Rocio Ortega. I'm an events associate at ProPublica, and I'll be your host today. We'll get started in just a few moments. We're just waiting for a few more people to sign on. Thank you so much for your patience. Closed captioning of the program is available and can be enabled by clicking on the closed caption option on the bar towards the bottom of your screen. Today, a panel of experts will talk about a small town's experience with the former uranium mill in New Mexico and what it can teach us about a failed federal regulatory system. And it looks like we have just about enough folks on now, so let's get started. If you're just joining again, my name is Rocio Ortega. I'm ProPublica's events associate, and we welcome you to today's event, New Mexico's Death Map, Uranium and Nuclear Energy in the U.S. Closed captioning of the program is available and can be enabled by clicking on the closed caption option on the bar towards the bottom of your screen. As an additional note, the session is being recorded and a link to the video will be emailed to everyone who registered in just a few days. For those new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. Today, a panel of experts will dive into ProPublica's investigation of the country's roughly 50 former uranium mills and the more than 250 million tons of radioactive waste they generated. Our reporting found mills across the West where companies were granted repeated exemptions to groundwater cleanup standards, their waste piles polluting aquifers even as climate change hammers the West and makes water an even scarcer resource. Leading today's conversation is Mark Olalde. Thank you all so much for being here today and I hope you enjoy the session. I'll go ahead and let Mark take it from here. Thanks, Mark. Thanks very much for that introduction and uh, thanks everyone for being here. Um, my name is Mark Olalde. I am an environment reporter in the Southwest office of ProPublica. So I focus on everything from water to oil to uranium um, in Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, and Utah. Um, quickly, we're going to uh, uh, show you a, a little video here uh, to get started. Um, what you're about to see is a uh, resident of the community that we're going to, uh, to be talking about here today uh, named Elaine Borchert, who was also a former, um, a former nurse who treated uh, uranium miners suffering from uh, various illnesses associated uh, with, um, with underground uranium uh, production. Um, you know, in, in this process of reporting the story, community voices uh, were, were very uh, were key in hearing what was going on, in getting a sense of the issues, the perspective here. Uh, so we're going to showcase a few of those. And we have um, a former community member uh, here with us as well. So uh, without further ado, let's take a look at, uh, at that video to get us started. And then I'll tell everyone a bit more about uh, ProPublica's investigation into uranium and introduce our panelists. In the summertime, when the wind is blowing, you can smell it in the air. And it smells like rotten eggs. I was disappointed in myself that we bought here. I moved to Grants in January 1st of 2008. This was a contaminated uranium neighborhood. I knew nothing about it. I was a travel ER nurse. The last nine years, I worked for a company that took care of the uranium patients. I was kind of shocked that there were that many sick people from the uranium mines in various stages of being sick. You don't really realize the magnification of it until you see all these people. Their lungs are given problems. Their kidneys would give them problems.
I don't need to make myself sick by staying here. I would move if they offered a decent price. So Elaine was speaking to a few issues there that our uh, panel of experts will, will talk about today. Um, one of the first is the uh, the uranium miners and sicknesses that they're still dealing with and legislative attempts to get them compensation. And part of that, uh, part of the issue is the main topic of the story that we published last week, which is the Homestake uh, uranium mill. Uh, there, it has 22.2 million tons of radioactive waste sitting next to uh, five subdivisions near the towns of Grants and Milan in Northwest New Mexico. Um, and uh, the question of whose responsibility it is to clean this up uh, how this gets cleaned up, who pays for it, um, are all kind of outstanding questions. Uh, ProPublica is still in the process of investigating this uh, former legacy of uranium, as well as the cleanup system underpinning it uh, for the next few weeks and months here. We found that there are more than 50 of these sites of former conventional uranium mills around the country with more than 250 million tons of, uh, of waste, some of it polluting aquifers, some of it near communities, and some of it in very rural uh, jurisdictions. Um, and so uh, I'd like to um, invite our panelists uh, to join on screen to talk more about the homestake question, to talk more about the uranium uh, question in general. So uh, if everyone could uh, jump on screen here. Uh, I'm very excited for everyone who is uh, participating and, uh, and has taken time uh, to, uh, to talk with us. It's going to be a, a great discussion. Uh, and like I said, we're going to talk about everything from our investigation into conventional uranium mills and their waste to abandoned uranium mines. And uh, what does the future of nuclear power look like in the US? Uh, joining me are Candace Head Dilla. Uh, Candace um, and her family moved to Murray Acres in the uh, in the eighties. Murray Acres is one of the subdivisions adjacent to the Homestake uh, Mill site that we investigated. She moved back there with her family, um, or excuse me, she moved back there with her family in the eighties and spent uh, spent decades advocating for cleanup uh, of that site through a community group called the uh, Blue Water Valley Downstream Alliance. So, Candace, thank you for for joining us. Uh, we have Leona Morgan as well. Uh, Leona is an indigenous activist who grew up on the Navajo Nation. Um, she works on behalf of communities in the Southwest that are impacted by uranium mining and has um, more recently been turning her attention to waste storage as well. So Leona, thank you for being here. Uh, we have Paul Robinson, um, who has uh, perhaps some of the most impressive breadth and depth of knowledge on uranium I've ever seen. Uh, Paul, I believe, spent 43 years as a research director with the Southwest Research and Information Center, uh, which works uh, quite a bit on some of these issues in Albuquerque. Uh, his technical assistance uh, work has focused principally on solid waste management, energy and water quality issues, as well as the impacts of mining and mineral extraction in the Southwest. Uh, and finally, rounding out the panel is Senator Jeff Steinborn, who's a member of the New Mexico State Senate uh, representing District 36 out of Las Cruces. Uh, and he is the chair of the Senate's Radioactive and Hazardous uh, Materials Committee uh, and the sponsor of some legislation that we're gonna talk about a little later today. So Senator Steinborn, thank you as well for joining us. Um, so to get started, uh, Paul, I was hoping you could give us a bit of a foundation, um, you know, uh, for our, our readership across the country, uranium might be kind of a new question for them. Um, maybe people uh, don't live next to giant piles of waste, uh, you know, like uh, like Leona and Candace have. Uh, can you give us a little bit of a, of a background understanding? You know, in, in 2004, you published what I would say is probably the most comprehensive study of these, these tailing waste piles to date. Um, which government agencies need to take responsibility for this cleanup system? And from, from your years of research, you know, on, on the question of mill and mine reclamation uh, around the Southwest and New Mexico, has the system worked so far to clean up the waste we left behind? Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mark and uh, panelists and others who might be listening and watching. Uh, that's a broad set of questions. Uh, the uh, uh, current uh, 
problems at uh, the home stake tailings pile uh, are the uh, legacy of the pollution from the processing of uranium ore. Uranium ore is a, a rock that is uh, enriched with uranium up to around 1%. And uh, once that ore is found, the uh, uh, rock is taken to a processing plant where it's uh, crushed and rinsed in uh, chemicals to remove that 1%. The 99% that's left behind is the mill tailings. And most of the radioactive material uh, it, and all the heavy metals associated with the uranium ore are left in the tailings. Only the uranium itself was removed. It's, it's decayed products like uh, thorium, uh, radium, uh, and radon uh, are left in the tailings. Uh, and the, the metals such as uh, selenium or cadmium or lead are also left in the tailings, only the values are removed. So the uh, uh, mills that processed uranium ore for the US operated from the 40s uh, when uranium was uh, uh, being acquired for weapons use and all uranium was owned by the government. Uh, there was no commercial market. And uh, through the uh, 60s, when the US decided it had enough uranium from all the bombs it could ever imagine making and stopped the uh, government purchase and began the commercial purchase. And the commercial purchase of uranium is the current market. Uh, New Mexico is the largest uh, producing state uh, historically, but ha is a uh, hasn't been producing any uranium for several decades. Uh, the resources that uh, New Mexico has are uh, quite uh, deep compared to the uranium resources in other regions. And New Mexico's resources are too expensive to survive in uh, uh, the current market and like the uh, future markets. So the cleanup of the sites uh, began in the 1970s. Unfortunately, the operators of the mines and mills before that uh, did not uh, manage their waste in a responsible way. Uh, none of them were good Boy Scouts. They didn't leave a place better than they found it. And so the waste, uh, solid and liquid, from the uranium mining through the 70s was left pretty uh, unmanaged. Uh, and this is the case for many different kinds of mining, not just uranium. There was a law passed in 1978, a Uranium Mill Tailings Radiation Control Act, which was the first law that regulated uranium mill tailings. Previously, they were not under uh, control of a license, only the mill operations. And uh, the implementation of that Mill Tailings Act is what's uh, gotten the 50 or so mill tailings uh, to the state they are now. Mill Tailings Act uh, ignores mines and uh, the mines are still uh, without a, a reclamation requirement. Uh, and so the older mill tailings, which were all generated from weapons uh, use material, those were all paid for by federal uh, appropriation. And the companies that have been hired by the Atomic Energy Commission had been paid a profitable amount to uh, produce that uranium. So the companies were paid good money and then all their waste management costs were bailed out. Uh, when it came to the more recent tailings operations, uh, places like Homestake, uh, Kermagee, and Anaconda, the big three tailing spas in New Mexico, they operated during the weapons period and during the commercial period. They're called commingled. And the uh, New Mexico congressional delegation made sure that the federal government paid for whatever government purchased tailings in these piles. 
so the companies were paid the first time for the uh, uh, business activity, which was profitable, then uh, paid uh, uh, on the order of $100 million and running for the reclamation of the tailings piles. And uh, uh, that uh, reclamation has not yet been successful uh, in terms of restoring the groundwater to pre-existing conditions uh, and uh, has uh, been going on for twice as long as the mill operated. Thanks, so Paul. Thank you for that. To the oh. future of uranium industry in a second question, but that was a long soundbite to give you. No, I I, I appreciate. It. I, th I I assume everyone uh, listening in appreciates the uh, um, the the lesson there and the the, the nice overview. Uh, Leona, I'm going to go to you because you know Paul talked about um, you know the the Mill Tailings Act um, and kind of creation of, of federal oversight, which largely goes through the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is kind of an independent federal body. Um, some of these areas, there's an agreement state status, which you know New Mexico had at one point, no longer has, um, where, where they oversaw kind of cleanup in their state at some some places, some parts of this, you know, some abandoned uranium mines, for instance, things go through the Environmental Protection Agency. But a lot of this world, a lot of the world of uranium and really the whole nuclear life cycle um, ha has been disproportionately uh, kind of on or adjacent to tribal lands. Much of this in Navajo Nation, um, but the Ute Mountain Ute tribe, some of the uh, Pueblos in, in central Northwest New Mexico as well. Um, and, and so when I say disproportionate, I mean, both the, the kind of labor and resources for the mining and milling often came from, from these reservations, uh, but also now the, the impact, you know, we have more than 520 abandoned uranium mines on Navajo Nation alone. Um, from your work with, with tribes around the Four Corners region, how would you characterize those impacts of the uranium and nuclear industries, you know, on Indian country? And what's the view today, you know, of the industry? Um, who's at fault for cleanup that might be stalled and, and what should we be doing about it? Uh, thanks, Mark. Well, um, and, and thanks, Paul, for the introduction. I, as a Diné person, I always make a disclaimer that I do not live near contamination. I actually live in Albuquerque, but I'm joining you from uh, the reservation. I grew up here and I will return here. Uh, I have a home uh, on the res in the Eastern side so my people um, were very well known and documented for the impacts to the workers, our environment, the water, our health, our genetics, our future, um, but there's also cultural impacts. So for example, um, contamination and desecration to our sacred places, our sacred elements, this impacts how we use them for our traditional um, ways. So for example, um, water, water is sacred, water is life. And when it is contaminated, of course, it impacts our health as humans if we ingest it. Um, and this is one of the biggest impacts is the un, un um, how would you say, unrecognized, uncompensated, unaddressed health impacts, not just to us as humans, but to all of our relatives. So the animals, the plants, our medicines, and again, our sacred places. Um, so as a Diné person, these are things that we need to continue our way of life and to protect ourselves. So when we do prayers and when we do our ceremonies, it's not just for us to survive, it's actually for, for all people. It's for all Mother Earth and even the whole universe for everybody. And so for us as Diné people, um, we, we are seeing the impacts, especially when COVID hit a lot of folks, um, still don't have running water. 20 to 30% of our people live without running water and electricity. And yet a lot of the resource um, minerals were extracted from our lands, uranium, coal, and now we're dealing with fracking. But um, just to summarize, uh, we are only one people. This has impacted indigenous peoples around the world. We can make the argument that Turtle Island is stolen lands, so the entire North and South America that has been impacted is affecting the indigenous peoples there. So like us down here, our relatives in South Dakota, the Hongpapa, the people in 
um, Mongolia, Saskatchewan, DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo, we are all impacted and we can see the lasting results today. Um, there was a health study, uh, actually Paul's colleague, Chris Shuey did some work with UNM um, to discover that there is uranium found in newborn babies today. And I just wanna take this moment to acknowledge one of uh, um, the uranium fighters who we just lost. And we attribute these deaths to the uranium industry, much larger than nuclear industry. So the entire fuel chain from uranium to energy, nuclear energy or nuclear weapons. So Carleta Garcia um, and her mother, Dor Dorothy Purley have done extensive work to help and to fight this, this, this problem. We just lost Carleta Garcia and her mother a while ago, but I just want to acknowledge they're from, Carleta is Acoma and Laguna, and, 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 and her mother was Laguna, and it's all, uh, all people. It's not just Deneb people. So I'm here talking about my family, the situation. I, I wanna focus on Navajo Nation, of course, but it is impacting all people. And indigenous peoples around the world, we estimate about 70% of the time. So environmental racism, oppression, the military industrial complex, it's still impacting us today in what we call nuclear colonialism. Thanks, Leona. And, and I think the points you're making about, um, you know, what can we attribute in terms of, of health, uh, you know, do, you know, what do we know, what don't we know about living adjacent to this pollution, you know, what that does to, to your health, um, you know, obviously is, is in an area that has unfortunately been difficult at times. And so there's, there's, thankfully great work being done in the Navajo birth cohort study and others to try to kind of quantify that. Um, Candace, I want to go to you because that's a question that you had to grapple with for years. Um, health issues in your family, uh, you personally, your your neighbors, and just down the street, this these massive waste piles. Um, I think an interesting thing to note in the Homestake case uh, is that the Environmental Protection Agency in 2014 did come out with a study and that did say there was excess cancer risk from this, this mill site, uh, which goes a bit further uh, than, than we can say in a lot of other uh, kind of frontline and fence line communities. Um, but Candace, can you tell us a little bit about your story? I mean, you fought for cleanup at the Homestake Uranium Mill for decades. Uh, you ultimately uh, decided to sell your house to the company and, and move. Um, how do you and your family, how did you come to that decision? Uh, and, and how do you feel, just what is the feeling from your family and from the community about the company's decision uh, to, to proceed the way they're proceeding, to buy out the community, uh, move residents, and kind of try to eventually hand the site over the DOE? Well, thanks, Mark. Um, of course, our community has been completely decimated. Um, what was once a very lovely farming community with lots of um, irrigation fields, crops, um, a close knit community, especially the Murray Acres a community closest to the tailings pond is pretty much gone, just a few residents left. And um, I guess it was a slow process. I think in the beginning, because, um, you know, I'm, our family moved out there in 1977. And in the beginning, um, they told us the water was contaminated and the company brought us water to drink. And a small group of people filed suit against the company and the result was that we received a municipal water supply. And so many in our community had clean water to drink and we were promised that in 10 years, this would all be cleaned up. And that was in 1981. And so I think we rocked along as a community thinking this was gonna happen, that our regulators were on top of it. Our lawmakers and legislators were well aware and we were writing letters and we had made them aware. And so we, we felt fairly comfortable. And then the 10 years came and went and, and we see that nothing had really changed. And at that point, we, the company was not paying for our water anymore. We were being uh, charged for the water that we used and we still couldn't use our wells. So we couldn't have gardens and some of the things that we'd had before. We still had a deep well that we were irrigating with, but unfortunately, and I think the KOB piece on this issue did a, a good job of pointing that out too. Billions of gallons of that fresh water was being used in this 
really poor system. So what they were basically doing at our site was just flushing the contamination and trying to dilute it. It was a dilution. And so over time, I think, um, especially when we banded together in the MACE organization, the Multicultural Alliance for a Safe Environment, I think we began to understand as a group, uh, LAXI, the Laguna Acma Committee for a Safe Environment, INDOM, the Eastern Navajo Diné, um, against uranium mining, uh, Red, Wan, Red, Red Water Pond Road community and the post 71 folks. I think we began to understand more about the regulatory process. We began to see some of the really huge forces that were arrayed against us in terms of companies that netted billions of dollars every year and had access to legislators on almost a monthly or every other month basis would come in and talk with our you know, state legislators, senators, et cetera. And we started to realize not only the, the environmental factors that were arrayed against us, but also the, the, the regulatory and legislative factors that we were fighting. And over time, I think people in our organization, I, I will say in particular, Laura Watcham Pino, really educated us about the effects of radon. And we became more and more concerned, at least my family did, about what that might have been doing to us. And um, over time, I have said I lost my thyroid. Um, it's all been removed. My mother had breast cancer, is a survivor. And we just started noticing people in our community having some of these same issues, particularly cancers. And at a certain point we stopped and did a survey just to see who in the, com in the community was sick and what were the illnesses and what were we seeing. And that's um, the death map that we created because there were uh, a number of deaths right around the tailings pile. And we were shocked, I guess, we didn't realize until we put it together in one place, how really serious the problem was. I think we became even more concerned at that point. So slow process. And I think being banded together, all of these groups in the MACE Alliance really helped inform and educate us. And um, so, yeah, we actually got out as fast as we could, my family, at least in the, the group that, that um, I think were the most concerned about the health effects. Thanks so much, Candice. And, and, and you mentioned it, and it, it's a reoccurring theme in our story, is that uh, you know promises were made and deadlines were made and targets were made. And then those promises were shifted and those deadlines were shifted and those targets were shifted. And, and that, that's by no means is home stake um, totally unique in that, right? In, in the, the, the question of cleaning up a lot of extractive industries, we, we see that. Um, so, Perhaps we have a bit of a solution. Uh, we have uh, Senator Steinborn here. Um, you know, Senator, earlier this year, you sponsored HB uh, 164, the uh, quote unquote uranium mine cleanup bill, uh, which Governor Grisham signed in March. You know, last year I, I attended the Radioactive and Hazardous Materials Committee meeting uh, that you chaired in Gallup, and that I, I think kind of helped spawn this bill. And I was intrigued at that meeting to hear both, there was quite a bit of surprise from some legislators at kind of the scope of the uranium question, as well as what seemed like nearly unanimous interest in addressing it. So can you tell us, you know, specifically on this new law, what will it accomplish in New Mexico? And then what's the current interest in Santa Fe in addressing legacy uranium and nuclear related environmental and, and public health issues kind of more in general? You bet. Thank you. Thank you. And again, uh, thank you for having me and thank you all for, for bringing attention to this issue. Now, the reason we had this hearing in Gallup that you went to was as somebody who's been in the legislature for a while, I find that this is an issue that we keep having the same conversation year after year, decade after decade. And I felt incumbent as a legislature, legislator who'd been around a while to educate the new legislators about this very important issue that needed to be on their radar. Um, but frankly, it, it's just such a sad environmental legacy that's been given to the citizens of my state and everywhere where we've done this mining for the national interest. And that's a really important point because I think that's where the solution needs to be. It's a point I want to make today with your national audience. It is 
completely incumbent, in my opinion, on Congress to write a very big check to take the charge of this situation and remediate these sites and figure out liability and, and assessing that and you know, getting made whole financially, but, but I think it is the federal government's responsibility, given that this mining was done for the national defense, as you laid out. That's a really important point, uh, morally speaking. But uh, our legislation, what we did was, you know, we have this case of kind of the chicken and the egg. Well, who done it? Whose responsibility is to clean it up? And we have in the state of New Mexico, and as was said, stated, we have we generated, I, I want to say 50 to 60%, I could be wrong and Paul will correct me, but we generated a huge percentage of the country's uranium for our national defense, for nuclear weapons. And um, we have about a thousand sites, abandoned sites in the state of New Mexico of abandoned uranium mine sites where there is no known owner or there is no owner currently in existence there's really no party that legally you can point to anymore in existence to say it's your job to clean this site up. They're just abandoned sites. And rightfully, we as a state for years have said, well, federal government, you really ought to do something about that. And we've written letters and Leona and I have been in committee hearings after committee hearings through the years. Let's send a message to the federal government. And finally, this legislation that we decided to do would be to have the state take a little bit more aggressive role in Number one, documenting all these sites, working with federal agencies, work with tribal governments, private landowners, and start to come up with a plan for remediating these sites and to document that plan, to come up with dedicated staff people in the state of New Mexico that would be responsible for abandoned um, uranium mine remediation. So this bill, we actually also raised the money in the state budget to hire coordinator positions in both the New Mexico Environment Department and the New Mexico Energy and Minerals and Natural Resources Department, which they will now be hiring these positions as we speak, which are coordinator positions. And so it's really kind of getting an organized process around identifying these sites, documenting and mapping them, coming up with a plan, but, but make no mistake, it's gonna cost billions of dollars to remediate them. And the federal government needs to write a very big check. They need to get their checkbook out. And that ought to be our message today. Federal government, it's time to write the check. And uh, I've reached out to our federal delegation. I know Senator Heinrich, I will give him a shout out because he's working to get billions of dollars in various different pieces of legislation to do some of this work. I know that Senator Lujan's office and Congressman Teresa Leche Fernandez, they're all very interested in doing this work, but of course they need support from their colleagues. And, and I would remind people from other states and their congressional representatives. New Mexico patriotically did this for the national service. And we were left with a huge environmental catastrophe, environmental hazard, destroyed land, water, people's health, and it's time to make right. And so, um, so New Mexico, we passed this great bill. We're gonna have an effort that we can now have accountability that can come before us and testify and tell us, hey, here's where we're at but we need the federal government to write a very big check. Thanks, Senator. And I do want to mention on that point that uh, we did in the lead up to this event, reach out to uh, several members of the uh, New Mexico uh, congressional delegation um, who had scheduling conflicts. Um, and also on the note of, of other parties we reached out to um, uh, in the course of the story, Homestake, the mining company in question did say they've done all they can to clean up the groundwater. Um, they do say that the uh, that the health implications of this, uh, you know, uh, that that Candace documented and, and others documented on the death map, um, they do push back and say there's not definitive um, uh, proof of that. In speaking with the NRC, they um, you know they they do acknowledge the delays. Uh, they do express uh, regret for the delays uh, in the cleanup at the homestake site, but say that they are focused on um, on cleanup as opposed to on the deadline of cleanup and uh, and the local regional EPA office uh, did not respond to us, although uh, multiple attempts were made to reach them. So I did want to make sure that that was uh, that th those points were made clear um, because there are obviously lots of uh, lots of voices in this issue. I want to open up the panel a little bit more to um, to everyone. And, and this is this is going to be a, a bit of a, a broader question, um, but I think from the, the kind of different angles that that all four of you are involved in this, the, the uranium question, have a bit different perspective on. And that's 
the question of public health, right? That's that's kind of why we're the major reason, one of the major reasons we're here uh, today. So could each of you just take two, three minutes um, to, to, to talk us through kind of the, the major public health question, concern, solution, if there is one, that you see from your work in uranium. Um, you know, Candace, you've obviously worked on the death map, Leona and Paul, I'm hoping one of you can mention uh, and help explain for our audience the Navajo birth cohort uh, study and some of that uh, work that's ongoing. Um, you know, Steiner Steinborn, uh, some of the federal questions we are talking about might be the Radiation uh, Exposure Compensation Act, if you could kind of give us a quick uh, uh, detail of your stance there. And if there is a, a role for the state, if this needs to totally be a, a federal check, but could we just go through the line? Um, maybe Candace, let's start with you and, and, you know, the major public health question and if there is a solution in your mind. Well, I do think um, there is um, a partial solution um, and I'm gonna push back a little bit on having the federal government alone write a check because I think um, the responsible parties need to also be responsible for um, the contamination and the fact that they, they took the, the money from us, they, they made money on these operations, they promised to clean up, they were, they were liable for cleanup and I think they need to be included in the solution. So the responsible parties are, are very important in this, in this solution. The other thing is I think we need um, some sort of compensation. We know the kinds of illnesses that are related to um, exposure to rain on and to the kinds of contaminants that were in the water that we drank. And I think for those people who develop those illnesses, there needs to be support for them. They need to, and, and people who have died, the same sort of program that the that RICA has right now for uranium miners and, and millers um, needs to be expanded to those who worked post 71 as Linda Evers has worked tirelessly for all of these years in her group and um, needed to be added to it are people like those at the Redwater Pond Road community, those at the um, Jack Pile site in Laguna and Acoma. Folks at all of these communities need to be part of a program like RICA that compensates them and helps them with the illnesses that may be related to living near this site, drinking the water. And perhaps I can jump, I'll jump in there and thank you. And Kenneth, I agree with you totally. I guess I was referring primarily to all the abandoned sites where, where there is no responsible party, but I agree with you. Responsible parties absolutely should be held to account, including for any malfeasance or deception. Um, I think there, there should be up to criminal uh, exposure for, for people's lives who were harmed through, through dishonesty. But um, so to the question you had asked Mark about health impacts, they, they continue to this day. Uh, Leona took me to a, just a heartbreaking site of a, one of the biggest, if not the biggest spill in the country's history at uh, Church Rock. My, my, is that the right name of it, Leona and Church Rock? And, um, you know, people whose tribal lands and ancestral lands, I mean, that's where they live and, and now their lands have been polluted, their waters have been polluted, health, it's just such a heartbreaking situation. And, um, and, and of course, these water plumes, these, you know, contamination spreads, it migrates. So you really have to, to deal with it. It remains a really serious threat for, for the lands where they exist. We are working to expand um, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act for um, what we call downwinders, people uh, affected New Mexicans tested by the Trinity testing of nuclear weapons, New Mexico was left out of that bill. And we have an incredible group uh, organization in New Mexico, um, led by Tina Cordova and many good advocates to do that. And unfortunately we had, uh, I would say some extreme members of Congress who oppose that. And because of them and them alone, seemingly even though we had bipartisan support, they did not ex expand that exposure compensation to Mexicans. I love your idea, Candace, about also styling a, a, a model after that to take care of people who have been affected by uranium mining. I think that is a really terrific idea, totally appropriate, because again, this was all done to support the national mission. And, and it's all back to this theme that the federal government needs to be good citizens themselves and, and do right by people who are hurt for the national mission. So. Those are my thoughts. Uh, 
Yeah, I thank you so much. Um, so uh, Candace mentioned RICA, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act uh, leaves out quite a few people, um, namely the very first victims of the very first uh, atomic weapon, which it was the Trinity test also in New Mexico. Um, it leaves out different downwinders of different projects and you know, no, uh, no downwinders of uranium mining and then even only some workers. Um, and then there's the date as well. It only compensates uh, uranium workers before 1971. So Paul mentioned in the opening, you know, some of these timelines and um, the depending when the mining occurred, what the use was for, and you know, all of these different um, conditions, it determines today what laws are used, who oversees them, where the money's coming from, and makes it incredibly complicated for grassroots people, uh, community people to follow. So we have Homestake Barrett Gold, United Nuclear Corporation. Um, energy fuels. We have all these companies that came in, they took the profit and they left the mess. Yes, they are responsible parties. However, all of the abandoned uranium mines, so any of the mines um, that were left here with no PRPs or potentially responsible parties, you mentioned Navajo Nation has, uh, they estimate 523 AUMs, abandoned uranium mines. The people that live on the land, they say it could be upwards of 2000 because the government doesn't count everything. The industry didn't report everything. So the industry is largely you know, self-regulated. They self-report. Um, I've never seen a NRC coming out or you know, any, any agency um, to, to measure radiation levels at the fence line and things like that. In Church Rock, what happened on July 16th, 1979 was 93 million gallons of liquid radioactive sludge washed 100 miles westward, and none of that was ever characterized. In 2015, along the river where this uh, contamination was carried, there was a community in Sanders, New Mexico that was measuring twice the legal limit of uranium in their drinking water. They were handing out bottled water at the schools, and the people attribute this to that, to that 1979 spill, yet, what we're told is it's naturally occurring. So these are some of the ways the companies skirt responsibility as well as the government. So if we cannot find companies that are responsible to do the cleanup, it is the federal government's responsibility. At the end of the day, they are the responsible party. And to answer your question, Mark, the very, very, very simply, how do we address this public health problem? We, we stop making more waste. We stop mining uranium. We stop producing nuclear weapons. We stop putting billions into nuclear bailouts. We stop putting trillions into the nuclear weapons industry. And we put that money into environmental cleanup with the strongest, most stringent cleanup standards, not just you know, in white communities, but across the board. Because this, th these are some of the discrepancies that we've seen where some communities, um, white communities in, Col in Colorado have received some type of cleanup where Diné communities, communities in, you know, uh, people of color in, in poverty, impoverished communities do not receive the same kind of cleanup. And so I'm just gonna um, finish my, um, my thoughts here with a, a statement from the Navajo Nation EPA director, Belinda Shirley. Belinda Shirley has um, informed me that her clan uh, grandpa, so in our culture, we have our, our clan system. Um, she said, uh, one of our former chair, chairpersons, Peter McDonald, he had um, made a lot of noise about the abandoned uranium mines to the federal government. And so what she told me that today, 55 years later, as the EPA director for the Navajo Nation, she is still waiting on some attention from the federal government. What they're saying is when, when this happens in a non-native community, in an urban community like Three Mile Island, this was in also the same year as the church rock spill. So in March, 1979, the nation's eyes were on Three Mile Island. And when you talk about Dinepikea or Navajo Nation, what, what Valinda said is the attention paid by the federal and state authorities is minimal at best. And it's been 55 years since her her grandpa, her Che, her uh, relative made that statement. And she today, 
she said, I ask myself daily, when will the federal government bear the responsibility of the abandoned uranium mines in Dnepikaya? So this is um, not just coming from me, but also community people. Um, again, going back to Rika, if you look up Rika and the health um, impacts, I can say in my in immediate family, in my extended family, who has uh, each of those different health impacts? And maybe not in my community, but of course in our extended um, community, we do know people that have suffered cancers, miscarriages, um, problems with the babies, um, thyroid disease, like Candace mentioned, pulmonary fibrosis, and, and all of these autoimmune diseases and, and different things. And then what we don't know that is still yet to come, we, have, we, are, we, we really need to study this stuff. So stop making waste, stop mining, stop weapons, and start cleaning up. Thank you, Leona, and thanks for sharing that statement. Uh, for anyone who didn't catch, uh, from uh, Belinda Shirley, who is the executive, executive director of the uh, Navajo Nation um, EPA. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, you mentioned studies, and we've got the man himself, Paul Robinson. Paul, could you tell us a little bit about what we do know? Uh, like I mentioned in, in the, the Homestake case, the company says, you know, we didn't cause this directly. A judge, uh, several judges, agreed with them and said, you know, we, you, we can't prove that for sure that this, these health implications are one-to-one. -one. Um, what do we know about health uh, in uranium? And can you tell us a little bit about ongoing uh, work in that space? Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, the uh, first uh, several generations of uranium mining were done without any health studies at all. It wasn't until the uh, uh, early uh, 70s that the first studies of lung cancer among miners who were, had a much higher exposure than uh, people who lived near mines. So the uh, no data, no problem uh, legacy of the atomic industry begins at the front end where there was a denial about the lung disease that was occurring among the uh, uranium miners around the world. Uh, and uh, there was no education done, much less uh, preventive uh, uh, equipment provided. And so there have been, uh, that's one of the reasons the federal government is now liable for the uh, radiation exposures of the minors that are covered by the recently expanded legislation. That legislation, uh, that's the third time that legislation has been extended. I was testifying on the first round in 1990. Uh, the uh, uh, federal government has no uh, legacy of proactive mine reclamation. You talk about your oxymorons. Proactive mine reclamation is not something the federal government has ever uh, invested in. And only after litigation has the multi billion dollar fund for the Navajo uranium mines been accumulated. It's not that uh, there was an appropriation made, it was that liability was found. And that uh, multi billion dollar fund is the biggest employment source for uh, uranium jobs in Navajo country and in other parts of the Southwest. The uh, problem of uh, the Homestake site where uh, so much has been invested by the company in dysfunctional reclamation methods, uh, that's not the only tailings pile which is in a floodplain, which is uh, going to be a perpetual source of leakage and trying to move that pile, source control, move it out of the stream bed where it was placed when the tailings uh, operation, uh, generation began in the 50s. That's the only way to prevent releases on that site because the site's too porous and the way uh, barracks, our predecessors uh, uh, treated the site was to make sure flushing was easy to do. Uh, in the future, uh, we uh, are going to see continued need for reclaiming of these sites. The uh, sites are going to need perpetual monitoring and maintenance funds. They're never going to be finished. 
and the in situ mines, the types of uh, solution mining, which is uh, preferred around the world and for which there's many sites in the US licensed, those all have alternative concentration limits. They're not able to restore to their original uh, standards. Uh, so there's, there's no example of uranium sites returning to pre-existing conditions. So some of the health studies that have been ongoing are very important. Uh, the birth cohort study is a study that involved the Navajo Nation uh, Department of Health uh, and uh, federal authorities and University of New Mexico. And it studied mothers and babies uh, prior to birth and after birth for about five years. And that uh, study showed uh, uh, that the blood samples taken from those uh, infants had urine uranium levels and blood uranium levels higher than a normal adult human. So there already was evidence in urine of a high uh, content of uh, uranium in these infants, and there's been no uranium mining on that donation for three generations. Uh, so how the uh, third and fourth generation of children got this uranium burden is a very uh, distressful and concerning uh, matter. And the generosity of the mothers and families to share that uh, uh, their fluids with scientists who allow this study to be done is also a very brave thing because that's not an easy to do within a cultural context. The uh, current study is a, uh, a study called uh, Metal Exposure on Tribal Lands in the Arid Southwest. And it is looking at the dust from uranium mines and finding that there's a uh, high uh, uh, occurrence of very fine particle, breathable dust that includes not only uranium and arsenic, but other heavy metals in the air near the uranium mines. So this is a source of airborne pollution that hadn't been demonstrated until these tests were done in uh, Navajo country and in uh, uh, Laguna. So trying to uh, demonstrate not only that that uh, dust occurs, that it causes lung damage, that's what that work has done, and that's uh, diseases in addition to cancer. Uh, the last thought I want to share is that even though uh, there's an effort to buy the land around the Homestake site, the Homestake site is at the confluence of two large watersheds, Blue Water Creek and San Mateo Creek, and it's on top of where uh, ir an irrigation system had been for 30 years. It's very porous uh, materials. Those streams are gonna uh, continue to flow in those areas. There's pictures of floods that some of Candace's neighbors have that uh, demonstrate how vulnerable those sites are. So Hope State may be able to uh, acquire land and move its neighbors back but uh, the city of Milan, it can't move. It's dependent on those sites for its water supply wells and the home, uh, the Acoma, uh Pueblo, they're not moving. This is part of their ancestral land as well as other communities in the, in the Western New Mexico and they wanna protect those resources. They're not subject to a land acquisition. So the uh, problems of Having tailings in the middle of a watershed with intermittent flooding, that's a permanent defect to uh, maintaining the effort to dispose at that site. Tailings ought to be moved, like the Department of Energy is currently doing with the 14 million ton Moab tailings pile in Utah. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, just a, a note on that, Homestake uh, does say that they've done uh, groundwater modeling showing their, uh, the contaminants won't move off where their uh, site boundaries will eventually be. Of course, we are still uh, waiting on that, uh, on that modeling to be made public 
Um, so we will dig further into that once we see uh, the numbers underpinning uh, that claim. But thank you all for that. Uh, we're going to uh, shift in, in in just five minutes here to some questions from you all. I see a lot of great questions coming in through the chats and want to make sure um, that uh, that we're getting to some of those as well. But one last question for me, uh, maybe Senator Simon, let's start with you. Uh, but we can kind of lightning th uh, through if everyone's got a quick one, just one or two thoughts on this. We've been looking backwards. We've been talking about cleanup at home state. We've been talking about uh, Cold War era stuff uh, that's still out there. Nuclear energy is not gone. Uh, it, it, I believe, accounted for about 8% of, um, uh, of, of power generation in America last year. Um, for better or worse, it is still greener than uh, fossil fuels in terms of uh, carbon emissions. Um, you know, so it's still, it still has a place in the energy mix for now. Uh, but the, the uranium industry looks very different than it did before. It's moved out of the Southwest in large part to Wyoming, Texas, and elsewhere. And we're talking about different types of reactors um, uh, that, of course, still have a waste uh, that needs to be stored somewhere. What, what is the future of the nuclear industry looking like? Um, and, and Senator Steinborn, anything uh, that you can say about this, what the state's stance is on the question of waste from it and how we deal with it today? And then anyone else who's got a very quick thought to add on that, I would love to hear. Well, you know, New Mexico is the poster child for challenging the notion or the statement that nuclear energy is, quote, clean energy. Yes, undoubtedly agree. Some of the emissions are absolutely cleaner than the alternatives. But when you're dealing with, you know, tailings pile of uranium mining, now nuclear energy still uses uranium, still uses to, to create the fuel for, um, for nuclear fuel in the reactors used in our country. When you're in a state that's dealing with tailings pile that have to be babysat, sat, whatever the right, uh, uh, the right way to frame that, by the federal government for 10,000 years, we have legacy sites here that are managed by the Department of Energy that um, will have to be babysat for literally thousands of years. That is a huge cost to pay as a civilization for, for choosing this energy source. And so we should do so with eyes wide open and frankly find other clean energy fuels like wind and solar that don't leave us this legacy of environmental destruction that we're finding from, from nuclear waste. And, and I will say that we are also dealing with this battle uh, for what to do with now the nuclear waste that we've generated at all the nuclear power plants around the country. And they are trying to shove that down New Mexico's throat which is another battle I'm uh, at the spear tip of trying to uh, get the state of New Mexico to pass legislation, actually making it illegal to store that waste here as Texas has done in Texas where there was also a site. And we all know Texas isn't exactly an environmentally liberal state, but um, the federal government does need to find a home for permanent deep, deep geological repository level storage of this waste. Um, but um, Right now, there's a very ham-handed, industry-driven, um, ir totally irresponsible and disrespectful proposal to just ship it all to New Mexico under the guise of some interim proposal um, by a private company, and it would be completely risky to our state and quite disrespectful and just add to the environmental legacy of disrespect that we've seen in this state. So we're fighting that. And again, as far as embracing more nuclear energy, we should be eyes wide open about the environmental, high environmental costs that come with that and seek alternatives that are um, superior in terms of their environmental consequences for the country. I'd like to jump in here because um, uh, Senator Steinborn's talking about Holtec and this is a fight that a lot of us are engaging in. Um, there's nowhere to put the high level radioactive waste from all of the nuclear power plants in the country. So the idea is to store all of it in New Mexico temporarily. Um, 40 year, uh, they, they are looking at a 40 year permit. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission just completed the final environmental impact statement for Holtec's consolidated interim storage site located in Southeast New Mexico. There's two sites actually about 40 miles apart one in New Mexico, one in Texas. And so while we're trying to make noise about the uranium waste, the federal government is entertaining this proposal from Holtec and then this other company called Waste Control Specialists to bring all of the waste to the Southwest by rail. And so something I wanted to point out in the, the article um, 
the, your article that is shedding light on the mill, the Homestake Barrick Mill, um, the Homestake Barrick Gold Mill. Um, this company, uh, like all the companies, they will feed you promises, but once they get their profit, they're gone. And so this, this is what we're concerned about with Holtec. They want to bring the waste as a private company, but there is no permanent place. So New Mexico will be stuck with it forever if we don't stop it. And earlier, um, I see one of the questions in the chat is asking, um, how can this happen on Native American lands? Well, the Navajo Nation has a law against uranium mining. The Navajo Nation has a law against transport of radioactive materials. However, we are only a quasi-sovereign nation. We are still subject to the federal government and our hands are tied when it comes to transport of waste across the Navajo Nation. The railroad goes all the way across the Navajo Nation from the Arizona side on the West End all the way through New Mexico. Um, and so we are, we can't move. In the article, people are selling their land, they're leaving. Indigenous people do not move. And so one of the other issues I'm working on um, with the uranium mining, the Grand Canyon is a place that's very sacred. Everyone around the world has heard of the Grand Canyon. They just, there's a company, Energy Fuels, they just got a permit for new mining at the Grand Canyon in April. And so we are still dealing, the Navajo Nation, we're gonna be facing the transport of that waste from the Grand Canyon through Navajo to the White Mason Mill. And, and, and we can't stop it. We need help from the states of Arizona, the states of New Mexico to confront the federal government. The state of New Mexico did pass a law to open a uranium office. It's a start, but we don't have a law to ban this waste and we need a standalone law. We need a lot of laws in New Mexico and we really need our state officials to uphold its own sovereignty as a state. Right now, it's like the federal government is just telling us what's going on. They're, they want to expand WIP. They want to expand LANL, Los Alamos National Labs. So we're dealing with several fronts, not just uranium cleanup and Holtec, but all of the nuclear sites in New Mexico. A friend of mine, Patuch, says, we are addicted to nuclear monies as a state. So New Mexico, we have benefited a little bit. There were some jobs. We got some roads, things like that. But in order to realize that we have a problem, just like in, in, in any kind of problem, and then, and then accept that there is a problem and start to address it. So, um, yeah, thank you. I think you, Leona, uh, thank you, everyone. Mark, it's very disappointing to hear you uh, accept the concept that nuclear power has some ability to demonstrate that it is a low emission energy source. If you think about all the concrete that's got to be made and all the piping that's got to be slapped into those enormous machines and none of them have been to decommission. How much energy is going to take to decommission those things? You're going to have to have reactors for power to decommission the reactors. I don't think there's any basis in saying nuclear power is green it, um, only if you isolate the reactors themselves from all the different stages in the fabrication. And there is no waste management uh, demonstrated. They're still trying to put their second interim storage site in New Mexico. Uh, Cause the first one they got in calling it interim and that was 40 years ago too. Uh, so there's not really a lot of goodwill. Once, once the mines and tailings piles are all cleaned up, maybe somebody would believe the nuclear industry can actually clean up after itself, but there's no demonstrated capacity to do that. And of course, nuclear power is the most expensive way to boil water. And, and I it guess. continues to be. And so you don't have the opportunity to have distributed nuclear power where people can generate their own power on their homes and store their own power. Uh, increased uh, energy efficiency reduces demand. So just building new reactors is a very poor approach unless you're invested in the reactor companies. I'd like to ask Paul too, Mark, if I may, um, would he agree that the market, the private market has, for those who are fans of Milton Friedman and the like, the, the private market has spoken in terms of nuclear uh, energy. Uh, private investors have, have shied away from it, the costs, 
the cost overruns, the safety factors. Um, I, I don't think uh, without the, the government's su tremendous subsidies that it would be something that the private sector would uh, be interested in at all. You get the uh, a similar sort of a tone, Mark, in the discussion of the other kind of uranium mining, the in situ mining, where uh, it doesn't make tailings uh, and it doesn't make uh, shafts and pits. So uh, how bad could it be? Well, it can ruin groundwater. You uh, leach chemicals into the groundwater. They can't be stabilized effectively. And groundwater is the only water available in most of the West where the uranium deposits are. So th the water trumps the resource value and the people who have to live in the places during and after the mining, the water is a much more important commodity than the resource that uh, is a temporary boom in the local economy. Thank you for that nuance, Paul and uh, Kenneth. Yeah, I think a lots of uh, lots of factors um, that have to be considered in any sort of uh, energy uh, energy production. Um, and so, thank you for uh, for kind of highlighting uh, all the various aspects of that. Um, thank you all for a thoughtful discussion so far. We want to open it up to uh, questions from uh, from the audience. I see uh, a number of questions already starting to roll in. Um, also, please uh, share feedback today uh, about uh, about today's events and suggestions. We have a, a great events team here at Republica that hosts these types of discussions about our stories. Uh, so, any feedback for future uh, events is um, uh, is greatly appreciated. And that uh, link is being shared in the chat now. Also, want to take a moment. Uh, this uh, type of investigation, this type of research, has uh, is is wide ranging. Uh, you're seeing my face today, but I'm I'm just one of a of a team. So uh, a quick shout out to uh, Maya Miller, reporter who co-wrote this story, as well as uh, Mauricio Rodriguez Pons, Ed U, Alex Majewski, Molly Simon, and many others who helped uh, report, uh, shoot the story, um, and and highlight uh, highlight the issues here. Um, again, if you'd got, like to ask a question, click the Q&A, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen uh, to submit those. Um, I'm seeing a few roll in uh, asking uh, at Homestake and more generally, can further groundwater cleanup, uh, to, to Paul's point of the groundwater kind of being uh, the main concern here, or one of the main concerns uh, at these mill sites, can groundwater be cleaned up further? Um, are the exemptions that are being given, are they, are they necessary? Like, is there really no more we can do? And a related question that I want to toss in there, because I think it's a pretty interesting kind of tech type question, is could we go back to this waste and remine it or remill it to pull more out, more of the uranium and other materials out of it, uh, maybe as an economic cleanup solution? Um, so what else can be done with this waste? What, uh, what are your thoughts for the panel? Well, it's an interesting prospect, and many people have looked at that uh, in great detail, and there are still companies trying to uh, uh, recover valuable uranium off the remaining uh, debris from a first round of recovery. Uh, but the problem is that as you get to that last five or three percent, uh, the uh, values are increasingly expensive to recover and the cost of uh, recovering all of the uh, minerals uh, making for pure sand, rinsing all the metals out. Uh, the technology isn't uh, yet available, but it's a, it's a common direction for research, both within this metals research program I mentioned at UNM and also among other uh, investigators, you have to pick up the stuff you've got out there, process it, and then clean up underneath the waste piles. So getting a clean source of material is much more difficult than cleaning up a, a dirty site. I would say too, Mark, that one of the problems at um, the Homestake Bear Gold site was that they never um, committed the type of the level of reverse osmosis to the site that was needed. So they had probably, I mean, Paul can speak to this better than I, maybe a 10th to a, a, a 20th of the 
the amount of reverse osmosis they needed to, to happen at the site. And even what they had um, only uh, operated at about 25% capacity most of the time. So they've never really dealt and committed the resources to the cleanup to actually cleaning the water that were needed at the site, much less the other things that Paul's mentioned. I also see an interesting question here, uh, and Leon, I think you were uh, responding to it in the chat, but would love uh, the thoughts on someone asked about the the kind of mental health of um, you know frontline communities. Uh, you know, Candace, I know you and I have spoken about this in, in your situation. You know, uh, even just kind of years of activism. Um, how do you either on the on the kind of academic side of their studies that that get into a sort of question of you know, is pollution also a mental health thing in, in addition to a, a physical health thing? Um, but but also just kind of what, you know, uh, Leona, because I saw you already answering that, let's start with you first. You know, from the other side, what do we, what do we know about it? What can we say about that, that question? Well, as far as I know, it's not being addressed. Um, I, for example, on the Navajo Nation, um, okay, I know my internet's a little unstable, uh, the Navajo Nation, we are working on cleanup, and the, the process is to work under the federal, um, there, there's what, what they call a, a cleanup plan. First, it was a five-year plan, and then a 10-year plan, and even some of the people who work within the Navajo EPA are suffering health effects from urine contamination, and the mental health impacts are really not being stated or even studied or addressed. Um, the National Association of Social Workers in New Mexico, the New Mexico chapter, has identified what they call eco-social work. So they're seeing these mental impacts the, to the communities that are scared of radiation. They're scared of what they don't know will come because of the latency period for these health impacts. It could take 20 years before you develop cancer. So that fear, that that anxiety and stress, it is, it, no, it's not being addressed at all. And on the Navajo Nation, um, just to add a little bit more, not so much on a personal level, but I would say as a, as a indigenous government, we are subject to the United States federal government uh, five-year cleanup plan, like I was mentioning, where um, EPA Region 9 out of San Francisco takes the lead and they make all the, the decisions on the contract, the cleanup contracts. So um, Daryl Yazi, who works at the um, Navajo Nation Superfund um, Department, he has been extremely vocal that the United States government needs to listen to Navajo Nation when it comes to cleanup and how to do the cleanup. Because it's not just about processing and, and, and nuclear science. We have, we have to put prayers into this. We have to consider the impacts to our past ancestors, our, gener our generations that we lost before us. And we're also considering the impacts to our future. So it's not just about us today. And we have to consider the, the metaphysical integrity of our cultural resources. And that is completely overlooked. So when Daryl Yazi is talking about cleanup contracts, we're not just talking about the remediation, we're talking more holistically about how do we address this problem from a cultural um, and spiritual way, because that's how we deal with stuff. And the, Nav the Navajo Nation has absolutely no authority on, on what happens with cleanup. It's the federal EPA region nine out of San Francisco. So New Mexico just passed this law to start an office, but I'm wondering how much will New Mexico push back on the federal government when we come to the actual cleanup and how it's done? Will they be listening to locally impacted communities? Will they be taking the lead from the people who have lived the contamination, who have lived through our families' deaths? That's what needs to happen. The federal government needs to look at the human impact. It's a human rights violation, our environment. Some people call it, you know, the environment. We, this is our mother earth, we are part of it. And so that aspect also needs to be considered. So short answer, no, none of it is being um, studied or addressed. 
And um, I, I wanted to, to take one more step kind of forward looking because I'm seeing a number of questions come through and I'm going to do my best to kind of synthesize them to, to, to get uh, as much information out there as possible in a short time. Um, and I want to start with you, uh, Senator Steinborn, because when I get an opportunity to, uh, to pick someone's brain who's, who's got uh, the ability to set the policy that impacts that when I want to take advantage of that, uh, I'm seeing questions uh, with people bringing up um, uncapped, unplugged orphan oil wells, um, bringing up the the specter of future uranium mining, um, kind of the the next, really the, the next, what's the next extractive issue or what's the next, um, you know, what's the next industry that we're going to need to clean up. New Mexico has a long history of resource extraction, many different types of resources. Also, many of those haven't been fully properly regulated and, and fully properly cleaned up. I think it's probably a fair thing to say. Um, from Santa Fe or from you personally, are there lessons learned that the state and other regulators can apply to, okay, here's how we can have responsible development. Uh, here's how we can properly have oversight you know, of these, these types of things moving forward. Great question. And, and not just great question for New Mexicans, but great for everybody listening. Economic development is great and it's important for states, but it should never come at the expense of selling out your state's environment or human health. And so what that means is that your state shouldn't just be blind cheerleaders and you shouldn't elect people who are just cheerleaders for industry. You need watchdogs and you need to drive a very tough bargain. And it's okay to say no to some endeavors altogether because they want that they want they want that at the cost of your environment and your health. We are fighting all kinds of battles, contamination battles in the state of New Mexico that I now have a front row seat for as the chair of the Radioactive and Hazardous Waste Committee. And I sometimes wonder, are we making headway on these issues or are we losing ground on them? It feels like a little bit of both. But we just had a hearing the other day in Clovis where we not only um, dealt with high level nuclear waste and proposed to bring in all this waste, and all of it from the entire country will end up on a rail line going from communities called Clovis, Roswell, and Portales, small rural communities, in rural New Mexico, up to 10,000 casts via armed guard. Imagine living in one of those communities for decades. But also we have a nearby military base who has contaminated a water supply for some of the, one of the area dairies in a contaminant called PFAS, which is known as a forever chemical. In our national lab, we're dealing with a massive chromium spill. And then of course we deal with uranium. So we have all these legacies. So as we look forward, we need to be aggressive in protecting as policymakers, but as citizens in protecting our water, air, land. We should expect that from our elected officials. We should draw a very tough bargain on what we allow to come into our states. And, um, you know, I mean, look at what happened in the Gold King mine, you know, in Colorado that blew out and, and then it polluted. And, you know, you have a lot of people in this country and politicians who like to bash federal regulatory agencies like the EPA or the Environment Department. But boy, when there's an environmental catastrophe in their neighborhood, they're the first ones going, hey, where were you? to protect it's the it's the, the biggest hypocrisy and irony you could ever see but but we need to invest in our regulatory agencies like the EPA like the environment department and really invest in a strong protection scheme so moving forward that's what i'm certainly doing as a legislature is trying to add in layers of protection you know things like we did with the uranium mining um but also you know, we're trying to do it with PFAS and all these other issues. So it's, you need the resources to be able to do the work because you were definitely up against well-heeled adversaries and uh, they will absolutely run roughshod over you if you let them. Thanks, Senator. So last question, we're running short on time. Last question for, for everyone. I want to get your thoughts. I've seen a number of responses come through the q and I've had a number of people uh, email myself or other team members uh, over the past couple of days since the story published. If people are so moved and want to get involved somehow in in these issues, um, you know, whatever side of that might be, what what would you suggest? Um, I'll I'll start. Um, I I believe that um, one thing they can do is go to the NIRS um, website, the Nuclear Information Resource Services. They have um, some good information about 
uh, nuclear in terms of the infrastructure act. And I think that's a good place to start and to start speaking out because we can't just sit back passively. I think as citizens of a democracy, we have to get informed and speak out. And um, I'd also recommend the Multicultural Alliance for a Safe Environment. I believe their website is southwesturaniumimpacts.org. They have lots of information and there may be places where you, for, there where you could donate to their work or help them out. So those would be good places. And I just wanna shout out not only to ProPublica, but to the team at PBS. And I wanna say something for one of our local reporters, her name was Kathy Helms. And over the years in the Gallup Independent, she has done some incredible, just mind boggling, um, been at every hearing and cranked out story after story. So people in this region were informed and I wanna thank her. But we need to stand up and, and be citizens of a democracy because that's our job. I think that was perfectly put. Anyone else have other other thoughts um, they want to add to what Candace said? Uh, the, these efforts, uh, these multi-generational efforts to try and get remedies to problems, they are worth fighting and they can be successful. And for communities whose land is at risk, there uh, uh, sometimes there's no other way than to keep uh, that effort up, and uh, that's how long it takes to get attention to and uh, try and get a problem solved. The idea of uh, eternal vigilance is the price of freedom. No one's going to protect your area or land unless you make the effort to try and do that. So staying informed and communicating among your neighbors and community uh colleagues and your leaders and representatives those are that's the way the changes that have brought what has happened now which is improvement over the lack of any effort that we saw for so many years when i was younger mark maybe i can make one final comment sorry leon i just say you jump on as an elected official i think a lot of times people look towards maybe elected officials or government or just someone else and they they expect that they will be the agent of change they will be the watchdog they will be the person protecting that they'll say somebody should do something about that um we all are that somebody in new mexico recognize your legislature we're volunteer legislators believe it or not um we do the best we can someone can do a heck of a lot better that's for sure <laughs> but um, but number one, in New Mexico, our government is very accessible. We have webcasting. You can send an email. You can participate. Never be um, fearful or um, in, um, intimidated by that. Play an active role. And wherever you're at in the country, um, I love what you just said, Paul, about, you know, every, all and, and Candace, about all of us being responsible for being watchdogs in our community. Uh, feel free to send an email to your local mayor or whatever about an issue that you're, it's important and you become, you become the agent of change. We all are agents of change. And, and that's so important in today's world. So thanks. Um, yeah, just to add, um, I've been doing community organizing for a long time. I started as a student organizer at the University of New Mexico 20 years ago. So, my experience just doing organizing is talk to your neighbor, tell your friends, tell your parents, tell your grandparents, because those are the folks who vote. A lot of indigenous people don't vote. It's a colonial thing. But what uh, Senator Steinborn just said, we're at these meetings all the time and I would love to see new faces. I think I met Paul and Candace, you know, oh, 15 years ago. And, and we are the same people all the time, not just in New Mexico but on a national scale. So I've been doing work nationally and then sometimes even internationally going to the United Nations convening of parties, which is a meeting regarding climate change. And, and all we do there is talk about how nuclear energy is not a solution to climate change. 
one of my colleagues, Gunter Ehrmeyer, he made incredible inroads to communicate with his Minister of Environment in Germany simply by talking about these issues. It's not hard. All you have to do is you can make a phone call, you can show up to a meeting, you can write a letter. If someone listening here today really wants to make some bold movements, the best thing I think is to have formal statements of opposition, formal statements of what kind of cleanup you want, whether that's resolutions or, or whatever. Go to your city council, go to your chapter house, go to your state legislature, write to your members in Congress because a lot, almost every nuclear thing is under the federal government. Everyone only has two senators. All you gotta write is two letters. It's so easy. So that's what you can do. People can say, we need to find a solution to the waste. I disagree um, with Deep Geological Repository for high-level radio radioactive waste. Um, with the mill tailings, I'm not sure. But all I know is these things have to be contained and kept away from humans, the environment, all life. And, and, and we have to figure it, figure it out together. It cannot be this top-down approach, this oppressive colonial way that we've been dealing with for so long. We need to listen to each other and the people who know the land the best because they are the ones who will know how to deal with it. Well, in just a moment, uh, we'll close by sharing a, a clip of a song from uh, John Boomer, who's an artist uh, who lives just down the road from the Homestake uh, mill site. It's a song that tells the story of the boom and bust of the uh, uranium industry and New Mexico's Grants Mineral Belt. Um, but first, just huge thanks to uh, Leona and Candace and Paul and Jeff uh, for taking the time, for sharing your, your deeply personal stories. Um, I've appreciated every time we've talked and I know that our, our audience appreciates uh, learning from you all as, as well. I wanna thank our, um, our, uh, our special thanks to our, uh, our, our partners on this, Los Angeles Times, Kelby Ford and Albuquerque, the PBS NewsHour for the partnership on the investigation, as well as on this event. Uh, and we're grateful to the audience for joining us for your thoughtful questions, for uh, engaging with the story. Uh, thank you. This is the engagement that, uh, that, that we're talking about, or at least the start of it. Again, this event has been uh, recorded. You'll receive an email uh, shortly from our events associate, Ocio, uh, with the full video of today's event. And we'll also post uh, the recording on the ProPublica a YouTube channel, anything ProPublica, you can find at ProPublica.org. Uh, from all of us ProPublica, thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of your afternoon um, and uh, please enjoy this closing clip. Thanks all. They made really good money for just hard labor. Guys would come in with no, no technical skills. They just were laborers. Even to show them how to use a air hammer and put them down in the mines. Thank you.